Last spring, I was invited to talk on a panel at an online learning conference. It was a good opportunity to talk about new collaborative annotation tools. And, um, uh, what's wrong with my face? I have Tourette syndrome. Shut it, ain't son of a bitch! That means I have a lot of motor and vocal tics, little involuntary behaviors that can be hard to suppress. Things like blinking, sniffing, <laughs> coughing, <coughs> throat clearing, <coughs> wiggling my eyebrows, jerking my shoulders, head turns, whistling, chirping, <laughs> sometimes even more complex series of movements or vocalizations. For this video, I'm gonna do something I haven't done before. I'm not gonna edit out my tics. I'm gonna let the camera roll. Talking about it makes it so much worse. <laughs> Having Tourette's isn't very fun. Every year or so, my body develops a new painful tick. My eyes, shoulders, and diaphragm are pretty much always sore. I have permanent difficulty swallowing, and I grind my teeth so bad my dentist thinks I need medical intervention. But from a scientific perspective, Tourette's is a blessing. It gives us a unique window into the structure and function of the human mind. The more I learn about it, the stranger the story gets. Ultimately, the story of Tourette's is the story of what makes us human. Stick with me on this one, because Tourette's syndrome is weird. I'm Ryan, and this is Language of Mind, and what you're about to hear is a strange, meandering story about a neurological disorder, the man who discovered it, and what it tells us about language, the brain, and our evolutionary history. So let's take a deep breath. That never works. I don't know why I try that. Tourette syndrome is named after this man, Georges Albert Edouard Brutus Gilles de la Tourette. Gilles de la Tourette was a French neurologist. In the late 1800s, he studied hysteria, a disorder based on a false and very sexist understanding of women's health and anatomy, and now hypnotism. Today we generally treat all this as pseudoscience, very sleepy. but at the time, it was all the rage. In 1884, Tourette's mentor suggested he examine motor disorders. It had recently been discovered that there were several culture-bound neuropsychiatric disorders that seemed to only pop up in specific cultures or peoples, like Lata in Southeast Asia, Miriachit in Siberia, or the nervous disorder of the jumping Frenchman of Maine, French-Canadian lumberjacks living near Moosehead Lake in northern Maine. They had been documented with strange symptoms that looked like an exaggerated startle reflex. If they were surprised, they might experience uncontrollable behaviors like jumping, yelling, or lashing out with their limbs. They also often uncontrollably repeated words they heard other people say, a kind of echolalia sometimes seen in other tic disorders. Tourette wrote a manuscript about these and other apparently related disorders. Eventually, it would bear his name, Tourette Syndrome. Have you ever heard of Tourette Syndrome? Mm -hmm. Involuntarily shouting profanity? It's exceptionally rare. Most people associate Tourette's syndrome with screaming swear words, but actually only about 10% of people with Tourette's have that symptom. Less extreme forms of Tourette's are actually pretty common. It affects about 1% of children and somewhere between 0.3 and 1% of the general population. The tics experienced in Tourette's are sometimes referred to as semi-involuntary or unvoluntary. They're generally preceded by a premonitory urge. You can feel it coming on. It's like a sneeze or an itch. You can try to suppress it, but it's not gonna feel good. Ticks in general are transient. They change over time. In fact, up to 80% of children with Tourette's will lose their tics entirely as they transition to adulthood. Tourette's also frequently co-occurs with other neurological symptoms, especially symptoms associated with obsessive compulsive and attention deficit disorder. In fact, some researchers have even argued for a single underlying spectrum disorder that encompasses autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's syndrome affects many different parts of the brain, but it seems to be abnormalities in parts of the frontal cortex and basal ganglia that play the largest role. A connectivity analysis of brain scans in 2012 found that Tourette's syndrome is characterized by long-range under-connectivity, but short-range over-connectivity. Brains with Tourette's syndrome have fewer and shorter pathways across brain regions, but more intense connections within small networks, especially in basal ganglia and this area, ventral left VA6. This is part of the motor strip but it's also part of Broca's area, famously associated with language production. These parts of the brain are associated with motor movements, knowledge about procedures and habits, and language. The neural circuits in these brain areas are hyperactive, and it's this hyperactivity that leads to motor and vocal tics. The reason these brain regions, frontal lobe and basal ganglia, are associated with habits and procedures is that they're intimately connected to our procedural memory, the memory system we use when we tie our shoes, play a musical instrument, 
ride a bike, or even do certain kinds of pattern recognition. And it probably isn't surprising that kids with Tourette's actually show an advantage on some sequence learning tasks, because the part of the brain that handles their procedural memory is overactive. They don't show any advantage when it comes to other kinds of memory. The benefit is specific to procedures. Another kind of sequencing that's handled by our procedural memory is speech. This also might not be surprising since Tourette's is so commonly associated with coprolalia and other kinds of vocal tics. But the process of stringing sounds together to make words is exactly the kind of thing procedural memory does. And here, again, kids with Tourette's show a speed advantage. In a 2016 study, children with and without the disorder had to repeat made-up words as fast as they could. Nightjovabe, Nightjovabe, Chovag, Chovag, Davinoichig, Davinoichig. The kids with Tourette's were almost half a second faster in this repetition task. That may not sound like much, but hey, it adds up. And it shows that the overactive neural circuits in basal ganglia and frontal lobe caused by Tourette's really do play a role in processing language. But the connection between language and Tourette syndrome goes much deeper than sound. To see what I mean, we're gonna have to take a little detour through the history of the English language. What? English used to look and sound very different than it does now. English is part of the Indo-European language family, a family it shares with languages like German, French, Greek, Persian, and Hindi. English is on the Germanic branch of this family, and West Germanic specifically. That means English shares a common ancestor with modern German. We call that ancestor Proto-Germanic. Nowadays, English has a pretty simple and reliable way to mark plurals on nouns, but this was very different in Proto-Germanic. In Proto-Germanic, the word for mouse was moose, and its plural was mooses. Over time, that final Z dropped, so the plural of moose was just moosey. Then something kind of strange happened. The final vowel caused the initial vowel to mutate. This was a common process in the Germanic languages. It's called umlaut. Moose remained moose, but moosey shifted and became musi. By the time we get to Old English, the final vowel is dropped entirely, so now we just have muse as a plural for moose. That vowel mutated two more times, becoming mice in Middle English, then mice in the modern English we speak now. It's quite a journey. <laughs> Why this story matters is that it leaves us with two very different ways of expressing the plural in English. Most words are simple. To make the plural, we just add s. Cats, dogs, birds. These nouns are regular. Their pluralization is a rule-governed process. But every once in a while, we come across a noun that doesn't behave. The irregulars. Words like mice, geese, feet. This regular-irregular distinction applies to verbs too. Generally, when we want to mark the past tense in English, we just add ed. Walked, called, slipped, played. But English has quite a few irregular verbs. Things like drove, ran, swam, lost, and held. For these, you can't just add ed. They're often unpredictable. This difference between regular and irregular has a funny consequence when it comes to our brains. The well-behaved regular nouns tap into our procedural memory, the memory we use for rule-governed procedures and habits like tying shoes, riding bikes, and playing piano. But the unruly irregulars require a different kind of memory, declarative memory. They represent exceptions to our rule, exceptions that we simply have to memorize. Our declarative memory is housed mainly in the temporal lobe, but our procedural memory, you guessed it, frontal lobe, and basal ganglia. That means that when we want to say words like cats and dogs, verbs like walked and slipped, and even more complex rule-governed word forms like mismanagement or unhappiness, we use our procedural memory, and therefore use the same frontal regions and basal ganglia that are affected by Tourette syndrome. In 2007, Matt Walensky, now a professor at East Carolina University, found the first ever link between Tourette syndrome, procedural memory, and language. What he found is that children with Tourette's have a speed advantage when they produce regular verb forms. Things like glued, sighed, scraped, and viewed. And again, they're almost exactly half a second faster in this task. So we can see a reliable speed advantage in Tourette syndrome caused by overconnectivity and disinhibition in neural circuits in basal ganglia and Broca's area. And we can see that this speed advantage applies not just to sound, but to the structure of words too. But Walensky's study found one more intriguing effect of Tourette's on language processing, something that really caught me off guard. Kids with Tourette's have a speed advantage when they name manipulable objects, things you hold in your hand like tools or utensils. Matt Walensky showed children with and without Tourette's pictures of objects like chopsticks, combs, hammers, staplers, and toothbrushes 
alongside pictures of animals like bats, beavers, koalas, and penguins. The kids with Tourette's could identify and name chopsticks and hammers faster than kids without Tourette's, but they were equally fast when naming animals. If you're like me, you're probably wondering, why? One possibility is that motor knowledge, knowing what to do with something like chopsticks, combs, or hammers, is associated with the meanings of these words. And that procedural knowledge can help you access the words themselves. That means that when we want to use a word like hammer or shovel, we might actually be tapping into our procedural memory. This is where the path in our story takes a sharp turn. We can see that Tourette's syndrome affects the parts of our brain associated with procedural memory, and procedural memory is necessary Nitro for both bay. language Nitro and bay. the motor skills required to use tools. If we just keep digging, we might find a direct connection between language and tools that can explain how and why we evolved to be so intelligent, so articulate, and so creative. This is an Acheulean hand axe. It was the most advanced piece of technology in the world during the Paleolithic. I can't give it an exact date, but I know it's got to be somewhere between 200,000 and 1.7 million years old. This tool was once held in the hand of Homo erectus. It was a multi-purpose tool. Homo erectus would have used it to butcher meat, skin game, cut wood, even dig in the ground. Before the Acheulean Age, the most advanced technology was this, an Oldowan chopper. Oldowan tools represent the oldest known stone tool technology, going back 2.5 million years. We know these tools were produced by Homo habilis, but they may have inherited the process for creating them from Australopithecus. Oldowan tools are simple. You make an Oldowan tool by striking a round hammer stone against a core of flint, obsidian, chert, basalt, basically anything that'll produce a sharp edge. Hitting the stone this way will split off a flake and leave a sharp surface on the core. Either of these could be used as a tool. The important thing is that making a tool like this doesn't require a significant amount of planning. You have to be selective about the material you use, and Homo habilis might have traveled some distance to find good stones, but you can generate a usable tool with a single strike. You don't need a very elaborate procedure. Acheulean tools are different. They represent a massive, innovative leap in stone tool technology. The Acheulean hand axe is a biface. Both sides have been shaped deliberately to produce a single sharp edge that runs along the entire length of the stone. Making a tool like this is a lot more complicated. It requires a clear goal. You have to know what you want it to look like, and a lot of steps to get there. It's a much more complex procedure. And that means that Homo erectus, who made these tools, must have had a serious capacity to plan and execute procedures. They must have had an enhanced procedural memory. Notice now that I'm no longer talking about Tourette's, I'm not ticking as much. That's kind of nice. We can reconstruct this process and find out just how hard it was to create these tools by doing some experimental archaeology. In these experiments, subjects learn how to make tools by flint napping. A 2015 study found that we learn these skills much better when we're explicitly taught than if we just imitate. And we learn them especially well if we're taught with language. In fact, it may have been ineffective non-linguistic teaching that contributed to the 700,000 year stagnation of the Oldowan stone tool technological complex. The sudden emergence of more complex tools in the Acheulean may be evidence of the emergence of language, or at least a kind of proto-language that enable the transmission of more complex techniques. But language has a much deeper connection to the emergence of complex tools than just information transmission. Some of the same brain structures that enable sequence and structure processing in language are also involved in tool use. In other words, language may have bootstrapped off our brain's ability to create and use tools. A recent meta-analysis looked at dozens of language and tool studies and found a reliable overlap between brain activation during language processing and tool use within Broca's area itself, in a region called the Pars Opercularis. This is a region that has long been associated with complex linguistic structure. Another study found that basal ganglia is highly involved in the recursive application of motor sequences, pushing buttons in a specific sequence according to a hierarchical rule. This is exactly the kind of procedure required to plan and build complex tools like the Acheulean hand axe. And it's exactly the kind of procedure involved in speaking a language. And one more recent study compared tool use planning and complex syntactic processing. They measured brain activity while subjects responded to complex sentences and moved pegs on a pegboard using tongs. And they found an overlap in neural processing for both tasks, language and tool use, both within the basal ganglia. This shared neural resource for both language and tool use also means that getting better at one task means getting better at the other, automatically. Subjects who were trained on complex sentences in the language task significantly improved their speed moving pegs with the tool 
compared to subjects who are trained on simpler sentences. Procedural skill associated with sequence learning in one domain can have a big impact on the other domain. Just getting better at producing and comprehending syntactic structures can improve your ability to use a tool, and vice versa. So we can see connections between language and tools in Broca's area and basal ganglia, the same brain regions that are associated with procedural memory and are overconnected and hyperactive in Tourette's syndrome. How would someone with Tourette's syndrome perform in a task like this? Well, we don't really know, it hasn't been tested. But I suspect we might see something similar to what we've seen before. That Tourette's might give a speed advantage both to language and to tool use. In the story of how we became human, Broca's area and basal ganglia seem to have played an important role. Both areas may have served as crucial hubs for our procedural memory and the skills required to both use language and make and use tools. Broca's and basal ganglia may have been originally recruited for simple procedures involved in tool use in Australopithecus, but eventually they were co-opted for the complex planning and procedures required to make more advanced tools, and the complex sequencing and hierarchical rules necessary for modern language. Tourette's is more than just a tick disorder. It's a window into some of our most fundamental human abilities and what they mean for our brains and our evolution. Overconnected and hyperactive neurons in Broca's area and basal ganglia affect the way we process sounds, access words, use tools, and do other sequence-related tasks. The same brain regions that are involved in language are also highly involved in tool use and possibly tool creation, so much so that improving our abilities in one domain also improves the other and access to language dramatically improves the transmission of tool-making skills. All of these factors seem to converge in a feedback loop that explains how we transition from primitive hominids to the most intelligent animal this planet has ever seen. And we have to acknowledge the role that Tourette syndrome has played in this story of discovery. That we owe to Gilles de la Tourette. Tourette's story has a tragic ending. In 1893, he was shot in the neck by a woman who claimed she was under hypnotic control. Later, it became clear that she had been suffering from psychosis, but they didn't know that at the time. Ironically, the attack disproved Tourette's theory of hypnotism. He had based his theory on the idea that a hypnotized person wouldn't be able to commit a crime. Although he recovered from the injury, it effectively ruined his reputation and his career. In the aftermath, his health rapidly declined. By 1904, 10 years after the initial attack, he succumbed to dementia and died. Tourette couldn't possibly have predicted where his discovery would lead, that it would help us understand the connection between language, tools, the motor system, the structure of the brain, and our evolutionary history. Certainly he didn't know that his syndrome, even if it is painful, awkward, tiresome, and inconvenient, could have a positive dimension, that it might give us abilities we wouldn't otherwise have. I really wish I could show him. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I've actually been wanting to make this video for a while, so I'm glad I finally got around to it. And yes, I really do have Tourette's Syndrome. I'm not faking. Years ago, I actually met Matt Walensky, that linguist who first found that language speed advantage in Tourette's Syndrome. We met at an academic conference, and uh, I told him I read his paper. I thought it was really fascinating because I also have Tourette's. Uh, he asked me if I had noticed that speed advantage in my own life, and I wasn't really sure, but I told my friend and they said, yes, obviously, every time I want to say something, you think of it first, and then you say it. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe this is all really true. 